Uh, good to have you with us, Congressman Jordan. Thank you very much for being here. Your thoughts good, today as we watch this, you. Um, you know, it, it is pretty striking that I think Americans become yeah. sort of inured to watching the former president go through this process. I didn't think I would ever see that. Well, I, th I do think the end result, the takeaway is, I, I think this just strengthens, just hardens the support for President Trump and frankly expands it. I think Dana was mentioned earlier in the show that, you know, you look at the poll numbers earlier in the week, I think it's 54 to 17 in the Republican mm -hmm. primary. But more importantly, he's dead even with Joe Biden in the New York Times poll. So my gut tells me, that's, is that what the New York Times is saying? It's probably better for President Trump in that in, 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 a, in another poll. And this, I think, only, again, hardens his support, expands his support, because the country gets it. And I think the reason that's happening is so much of the country is sick of this nonstop attack, this ridiculous attack on President Trump for seven years now. And they're tired of this, this elite attitude in D.C. that says, oh, we're better than everyone else. There's a different set of rules. And I think people in flyover country, Hillbillies in Ohio or Iowa or Oklahoma, they're so sick of it. We're so sick of it. We're saying we're going to support President Trump. I think that's the I think that's the takeaway. I think that's the, the result of all this. Yeah, I mean, that is absolutely echoed in the polls that you just mentioned and that we were all talking about just moments ago. It's clear and it's clear that President Trump, the former president, knows that. Uh, he said in his Truth Social nice. post just a short time ago, you know, basically, I'm doing this for you. I'm, you know, I, I, I don't mind doing this. It's an honor or something like that because I'm doing this for you. Um, it, it's fascinating to watch this play out, and especially so uh, yeah. in the wake of what we're seeing on the other side of the aisle with this Hunter Biden investigation. I just want to put this up while we're waiting for oh, this yeah. arrival, and I'll cut out of this if, if we see that arrival, guys. Um, sure. This is pretty interesting. This is a letter that Joe Biden wrote to Devin Archer in 2011. He was, I guess, um, you know, they were just starting out in this business, trying to put together a business that dealt with government regulatory um, measures and making that into a private equity fund. And, you know, all sort of under the auspices of the support that they would get from Washington at that time and uh, ostensibly the vice president. Dear Devin, he says, I apologize for not getting a chance to talk to you at the luncheon yesterday. I was having trouble getting away from hosting President Hu, uh, the president of China, by the way. I hope I get a chance to see you again with Hunter. I hope you enjoyed lunch. Thanks for coming. And then he signs it. And then a little P.S. He says, happy you guys are together. What do you make of this letter yeah. and his contention that he doesn't have any connection to his son or Devin Archer in the, these businesses that they were running? Just one more piece of evidence that he did have connections. And remember, two and a half years ago, we had a former business partner, Mr. Bobolinsky, say that the email from the laptop, the laptop we now know was real, the FBI knew was real at the time, the email, it says 10% for the big guy, he says the big guy is Joe Biden. We have the piece of evidence you just talked about there, this note from 2011. We have the WhatsApp message we now know because of the whistleblowers that came forward where Hunter Biden sitting beside his dad say, send the money or else my dad who's sitting beside me is gonna do something. Then we have the 1023 form, which says, you know, the confidential human source who've been trusted by the FBI, talking with foreign nationals, sending money to the Bidens for certain political outcomes, certain policy preferences it talks about. And then we have Devin Archer's testimony, where he said the value Hunter Biden brought to the business was the Biden brand, and the yeah. Biden brand is Joe Biden. And we have the meeting in Dubai where the two people from Burisma are meeting with Hunter Biden and Devin Archer, and they say, we need the government to step in, the United States government to step in because yeah. we're under so much pressure. You know what, so I, I want to put one more thing All that begins to pile up. Yeah, it does. And I'd love to put another piece of this puzzle in here, if I may, sir. Um, this I find fascinating. This is from the transcript of Devin Archer's testimony at Oversight. And I think a lot of people saw Congressman Dan Goldman come out and say, you know what, they were talking about the yeah. weather when, when Joe Biden was on this speakerphone. This is nothing. They checked in all the time. They're just a particularly close family. But when you really look at what was said here, it's quite interesting. Uh, Representative Goldman says Hunter Biden never asked his father to take official actions on behalf of his business partners question. Archer, he did not. He did not ask him, to my knowledge, I never saw him say, do anything for a particular business. Goldman, and you're not aware of Joe Biden ever doing anything to help his son's business partners? Question. Archer, no, I think the calls were, that was, that's what it was. They were calls to talk about the weather, and that was signal enough to be powerful. Right. He left out that last part yeah, of, when of, he was in front of the cameras, Congressman. It, of course, the whole idea was 
I'm going to get the vice president of the United States on the phone talking with clients and people we're doing business with. Of course, they're not going to talk about business. That wasn't what was needed. What was needed is, oh, I can get my dad on the phone who happens to be vice president of the most important country in history, I, who has a lot of influence in D.C. I can get him on the phone. Hey, everyone, do you want to say hello to the vice president? We all knew what these calls were. We didn't need anyone to tell us what they talked about because we knew it was exactly how Mr. Archer described it. Everyone understands that that's the brand, that's the access. And it wasn't an illusion of access because that meeting in Dubai on December 4th, 2015, where they talked about the pressure they're under, five days later, Joe Biden goes to Ukraine, gives a speech criticizing the prosecutor who was applying the pressure to Burisma. And that begins this pattern where over the next few months, they ultimately get the prosecutor fired so that he can get, so Ukraine can get the, the people I represent, the American people's tax dollars, for goodness sake. So it wasn't just an illusion. There was definitely access, and we see it from that December 4th meeting and that December 9th speech he gave, the vice president gave in Ukraine. So let me ask you this, because this has all been coming out of the House Oversight Committee. Does, does the FBI and the DOJ have all of this same information? And if so, what ha why hasn't it been further investigated? And I always go back to Tony Bobulinski giving his laptop and his phone to the FBI and then saying, you know, they never called me. They never asked me. So has there ever been an actual investigation into this? If so, not why? And if there isn't, what is your avenue and are, how, where do you stand on this impeachment question, which has been raised by some of your colleagues? Well, I think they have the information. That's why they structured the agreement the way they did. Understand that agreement that the judge said time out on, and God bless her for doing so, that agreement they tried to get through on Hunter Biden's plea, that, that, that they, there were the concerns there were they left out the 2014, 2015 years, what I was just talking about, because those are the, those are the years mm -hmm. that deal with Burisma and the money they're getting there. Those were conveniently left out. They didn't press the charges there. And Mr. Shapley and Mr. Ziegler said they should have. There was strong agreement in doing that until all of a sudden they have this meeting and they decide, oh, wait a minute. We're not going to go that route. We don't have special counsel status. We don't have what David Weiss originally said he did. That, I think, is why they did have this information and they structured the agreement to make sure it wasn't part of the agreement and they, they wouldn't bring those yeah. charges against Hunter Biden. I, I think that's what's hard for people. And I, and I do think that it cuts across lines when people just say, hey, does that... It doesn't pass the smell test, right? When you've got one situation where all the evidence yeah. kind of seems to disappear or get put on the back burner or get ignored, and then this really soft plea deal comes forward. Okay, we're going to be done with that one. On the other side of the screen, literally right now, um, you have the situation where this, this very fast pace to go through all of these indictments for the former president yeah. and to make sure that those trials are happening, boom, boom, boom. How are people to perceive yeah. that? No, I think you said this earlier, Martha, and I agree with you because I heard Andy McCarthy say, say this, the, the political overlay to all this, you see that happening. The, the simple selection of Jack Smith. Remember, Jack Smith is the guy who was trying to prosecute the very people who were being targeted by the Obama IRS back during the Lois Lerner thing a decade ago. Mm -hmm. So the selection of that guy shows the political nature of this. And then as, as you pointed out, as Andy pointed out, this just one after the other and the pace they're trying to do it, the way they didn't have any of the co uh, anyone else indicted in this indictment and it, it's designed to get to court as quick as they can because it's about politics. It's about stopping President Trump who went to the White House and did what he told the American people he was going to do. And that's why this bond is so strong between his voters and, and the president because they truly believe and it, it, they believe it because it's true. When the president says they're coming after me because I'm fighting for you, they know it. They know it, and today we'll just reinforce that, strengthen that, and I think expand it. Well, I think everybody would like to see a justice situation that you can have faith and confidence in, and where the people who are running investigations don't have political leanings. They tell us that all yeah. the time, but then when you watch how these things play out, people are smart, they get it, they see that the, the treatment feels yep. very different. And I do think that's why you're seeing this, this surge uh, for the former president. Um, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating situation I as agree. people are lined up out here and we'll see where all this goes. As it's the fair. Wall Street Journal said this week, you know, a difficult and dangerous months ahead um, as we watch this play out, these overlapping court room situations and a presidential campaign on top of each other. Last thought on that, sir. Well, it's been my experience when people have to tell you they're doing something, 
uh, they typically aren't. Mm -hmm. So that every time we hear them say, oh, it's about equal, equal application of the law, that's what we're doing. We're not biased, it's about enforcing the law. Baloney, it's about politics. You don't have to tell people if you're just doing it the right way, if you're actually equally applying the laws across the, across the board. Yeah. But when you have to tell us, in my experience, people have to tell you, oh, I'm the hardest worker in the world. Oh, really? Why don't you just work hard instead of tell me about it? Right. You see it all the time yeah. in life, and that's what we're getting from well, this, this administration. I think a lot of good Americans across the board on both sides, they want justice. If someone commits a crime, they want to see them do sure. you know, do the time or do the punishment for that crime, and they want to see things be even-handed across the board. They want to see accountability. Um, Jim Jordan, as always, thank you very much, Congressman. Great to have you here. Thank you.